I'm Judy Murray. Behind every champion is a driving force. Wanting to prove people wrong was something that was a very powerful driving force in me. We all got prepared for how to perform, but no one prepared us for what will happen after. Dina Asher-Smith, the best of British. If you can see it, you can believe it, and you can believe that that could be you. We knew that we was a part of something bigger. More glory for Sarah Story. If you don't stop doing this, you may go deaf. It was everybody else that almost had to suffer because of because of what I did. Stunning stuff from Anderson. Becky, I think you need a sports psychologist. And I was like, why? What's wrong with me? I was a little bit scared when he first talked to others. I knew that there was a massive responsibility. The undisputed lightweight champion of the world. Yeah! It's going to be an historic second goal. I didn't know about a breakdown, becoming a self-harmer, being depressed. had no idea what that meant. If you tell me I can't do something, I will go out of my way to prove you wrong. The first lady of all dressage, Charlotte Dujardin. Charlotte Dujardin has really brought dressage to a new level. It was incredible because the British won the European team gold medal. We'd never won anything gold um, in dressage. Charlotte Dujardin, Great Britain. How good was that? She is your Olympic champion for Great Britain, Charlotte Dujardin and Vallegro. I don't use this expression overly, but Charlotte is a genius. Uh, there's nothing else for her to win in the sport, and just when you think there isn't very much else for her to win, she goes and does it. Uh, what a trailblazer she has been, and Vallegro as well. She pushed me and pushed me and pushed me, and I think that's probably where I first started realising that drive uh, is, is almost more important than talent, because I've met a lot of talented people. The training of years comes together once again for Charlotte Dujardin and for Legro. Straight away, I could see something different in her, something unique in her gift to communicate with the horse or then her ponies. She really wants other people to learn the sport and to obviously fulfill their dreams like she fulfilled hers. And it is possible, well, she's proved that. The Olympic gold medalist, Olympic champion, Charlotte Dujardin. It, and then you're gonna push yourself up and swing your leg over. That's it, well done. And now you are aboard. You are aboard the champion. Do I need my foot in this other stirrup? Yeah, well, I think, Alan, can we just make the stirrups a bit shorter, please? Blueberry, that's it. <laughs> that's it. So, that's right. So now both legs together, now make him walk on. That's it. Right, and now you're going to use both reins together and now stop. So take your leg off, because that's still making him go. That's it. So your leg has to be relaxed away from his side. So this is tight, that's relaxed. Yeah, so if that is touching his side, that's telling him to go. To move. Yeah? OK, got him. So that's so if you let your leg, that's it. That's where your leg's got to stay. Straight. Yeah, when he does when he does that. So when he feels like he's like a bit on the on the rein, just like you just got to play with the rein. So you just literally like softly just like tweak the rein. Mm -hmm. And then he'll just soften to that contact rather than he'll pull otherwise. Got it. Yeah. So if you make you stiff, he gets stiff. Right. Good boy. He's right, you stay one. there. If you just make him walk on, Judy. 
I'll stay on the outside, so Judy, turn left slowly. That's it. Right, now you can just relax your hands down. That's it, and he'll just walk. There you go. And you can't go anywhere because I've got you one side and the wall's got you the other. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice now. Now you can just like have be nice and relaxed. That's it. And then the only time you really need to use the rain is if you want to slow down like now. So if you just like use the rain and just say, hang on, wait for me. There you go. And then you let go again. That's it. So if you make your reins a little bit shorter. All right, OK. Right, that's it. Pull it, that's it. Just make him stop. Right, OK, walk this way again. So walk that side. Wait, how do I get him round that that's side? That's it, use your reins. Right, OK. And then just walk forward. Going a different route. <laughs> and then you turn him back towards me. And as you can see, it's not as easy, is it? It's not. It's <laughs> not as easy. I've, I've even lost my how I should have my uh, how I should have my hands. Um, thanks for having me here at your yard and allowing me to ride on your magnificent um, horse, Olympic champion, world champion, who has so raised the profile not just of female riders but of dressage in particular. I'm so looking forward to hearing your story, assuming I can stay on the horse. Um, <laughs> so. Can we go back to where it all started and tell me a little bit about your childhood? My mum, she was a horse lover herself. She had horses of her own. She'd always say that I was like pulling at the rugs of the horses, like trying to get up on them. I used to put her actually on my show jumpers and they were like 16 twos. And in those days they had like an anti-cast roller on the back. So in order to keep her safe, is, well, as far as I was concerned, was <laughs> safe, and she used to hook her hands on top of the, the anti-cast roller and she used to rock backwards and forwards. And I'm talking probably she was 18 months old, she was very, very young. But when I used to finish mucking out that horse and take her into the next, or go to take her off to go into next stable, oh gosh, she used to scream murder. I never wanted to get off the horse. And that's really how it all started. And I got my own little pony. Mum gave up riding herself um, so that she could put her time and effort into me and my sister. So a bit of sibling rivalry there? Very much, very much. Emma Jane was a very, very good rider. Both of them, in fact, were very good. Charlotte did show the edge on her. I mean, at two, she used to do rising trot on the little pony that I'd bought her. Unbelievable. I mean, just, like, unbelievable. I was always very competitive against my sister. So as soon as Emma Jane used to come out the ring, I used to then have to put Charlotte on and just literally ride her around or let her lead around the, the um, car park to the horse box. Next problem was getting her back off the pony. Then I got to the age where I could compete against her and um, I'd start beating her. Of course, she didn't like that at all. Actually ended up giving up riding and um, then I, I carried on. As a young child, I actually achieved quite a lot. I was always one of the bravest kids in the showing world. I'd always ride everyone else's ponies, like all the kids' ponies that were naughty, so if they got bucked off, you know, it was be like, oh, put Charlotte on, she'll sort it out. She was very, very brave because I used to have to put her on the horses with my eldest daughter to help back them and break them and, you know, do whatever. So when we used to go to the shows, people, you know, you were envious of her, really, because, well, both girls, to be honest, they used to both get on the horses and a way to go. But Charlotte did have that little cutting edge. We never had a lot of money. As kids, we always had to buy naughty ponies because they were the cheapest ones. <laughs> so that's how I grew up. We had some really good ponies in the first onset, and then, unfortunately, things changed a little. So we had to buy horses that weren't quite what they, you know, they weren't trained, they were young horses and then we would compete them, make them worth a bit of money and sell them and then go again. Is it, um, is it an expensive sport to get into? It is quite expensive. It's like any animal, really, isn't it? Working hard to pay for them and, you know, my mum never did everything for us. We had to work as kids, you know, we had to get up before school and muck out, do them after school and do all the day-to-day -day duties as well. Charlotte, I think, has helped break down not just the barrier around women's sport, but also the belief that actually equestrian sport can be for the many, not the few. We'd go show after show after show. Dad would drive all through the night sometimes, we'd sleep, Mum would get up, plat, make the ponies look really pretty. You know, I'd get ready, I'd get on and ride with my sister. So it was a real family unit. I was very, very lucky to be able to have that, that my whole family were very supportive. 
my school never really understood what it is that I wanted to do and achieve. And I had all these dreams and I really wanted to make those dreams happen. I'd go off to all our county shows, come back and bring in my trophies and show them. And they're like, oh, well done. You know, you kind of just take them back a little bit with how they perceive what you have actually achieved. It's difficult, isn't it, when you've got lots of children with lots of hobbies and, and ponies. They, I think a lot of people just assume ponies as being a local Jim Carna, but she was obviously just doing county shows. So her wins were wins. They were international wins or they were Horse of the Year show wins. And it's very difficult for someone that doesn't really understand it as to how big you know, the occasion actually is. Now I can look back and say, well, there you go. See, that's why I was I bet so... they're dying out on you now. <laughs> yeah. I bet they're so close to you now. I actually got in contact with my primary school and my headmaster was still there. He was just, he was so made up that I had actually contacted him to say and let him know exactly how I'd done. What do you remember about your first pony? My real first pony that I really, really remember was uh, a pony called Old Mare Dylan. And he was a section A, steel grey, long mane and tail, and I absolutely loved him. He was my real first pony that I really, really remember a lot of, and I actually achieved quite a lot with him. It must be really tough when you have to sell them on. What's that like? That's something I've had to deal with um, in my career. I don't really earn money riding so basically what it costs you to go is pretty much what you get back i am not very good at selling horses i mean I, I think i've sold very few horses just because i love my horses like my horses are my life my best friends they're my partners and it is heart-wrenching when you have to have to sell one because it's years and years of training they become part of you it's really sad then when you have to hand the reins over and and let someone else take them on. What age were you when you joined your first yard? 17. So you'd finished school at that point? I'd finished school and then I met an incredible man who is a huge part of my life now, who's Ian Cast. And he actually used to teach me on my show ponies. Straight away I could see something different in her, something unique in her gift to communicate with a horse or then her ponies then. Um, that's never left her, she has that inside. It's something she's not learnt. The stuff I helped her with in her transition from showing to dressage was learning technique of certain movements, and, but the gift that she has inside to help a horse perform and, and dance is something inherent in her. He said, you've got to a level where you're too good for me, I can't help you anymore. You need to go to my trainer, which was Judy Harvey. And I based myself with Judy, who was an international judge and rider at that time. We boxed up um, Charlie McGee, who was the horse at the time, and uh, went to Judy's, and then Judy took her on as an apprentice. The first thing I kind of noticed with Charlotte was she sort of sat on top of the horse rather than into the horse, but she is and was then a very brave rider and had a great feel for the horse and had a very strong instinct for what was the right thing to do at the right time. And you thought, mm, hang on a minute, I think this girl can ride. I'd never been anywhere other than had my own pony, you know, with my mum. And then it was like going to work for someone and learn the ropes a different way. She now had to be here on time. She now had to uh, follow my rules and not hers. She was very old school. I was petrified of her <laughs> completely. I was always terrified of being told off, getting it wrong. Charlotte's mum was a very, very um, experienced horsewoman herself. And I think she liked to be very involved with Charlotte and her career. And she wanted to be very hands-on. And I think to develop Charlotte into uh, an independent rider, we kind of had to move her away from that a little bit. For instance, her mother always used to plait her horse for her for competitions. and. 
Um, the very first time Charlotte rode one of our horses, I said, no, that's not happening, Charlotte, you are doing it. Uh, you're going to learn how to clap and all the pressures it takes to get ready, horse ready for competition. So that you have to learn to focus on your ride and also getting the horse ready. And uh, that was a bit, that was difficult for her. She gave me four incredible years. I learned so much, get opportunities to ride horses that had a lot more experience than I'd ever achieved. And she really set me up on the ropes of, of what I needed to do to achieve my dreams. Then what happened? I did a world-class selection, so a day where you get put onto a world-class programme. We're lucky enough to have the funding and the help to be able to try all out for these programmes. Carl Hester, was he was one of the test riders. It was back in 2007, and in fact, I was asked to be a, a guest rider at a... Well, it wasn't a competition, but it felt like that, but it was actually looking for talent. Uh, and we were looking for talented combinations of horses and riders uh, that could be considered Olympic potential. And they ask you on the form, would you mind if they wanted to ride your horse? So I was like, tick, like, oh my God, <laughs> yes. Like, of could you imagine like one of the best riders, like my idols riding my horse? I was like, absolutely. So Charlotte came in on her horse, Fernandez, and he was uh, only six years old, but I could already see he looked quite well educated. But the interesting thing was he wasn't a particularly exciting, flashy horse. Um, he just looked like he was well educated. And so the selectors said to me, really not sure that that's an Olympic potential horse. Why don't you have a sit on it um, and uh, give us your feedback? He said, You've done an amazing job. He said he's a very talented horse, as you are, and I was like, oh, my God. So I straight away rang my mum, and I never forget telling my mum, like, I said, I'm never going to clean my saddle ever again because Carl has <laughs> sat in my saddle. It, she rang me up and she said, Mum, Mum, you're not going to believe it. I said, what's that, Charlotte? She said, Carl Hester has ridden Fernandez. I said, you're joking. She said, no. She said, Mum, I'm not going to wash that saddle because he sat on my saddle to actually have him touch and sit on her horse, she was, she was over the moon. I said to the guys, listen, this horse is definitely going to be a Grand Prix horse, I can feel it, and she's, you know, going the right lines, um, and I really think you should seriously consider uh, putting her on the programme. Mum then said to me, why don't you ring Carl, get hold of Carl, and ask him if you can go and train with him? So I was like, oh, no, I can't. She's like, go on, you can do it. I rang Carl and I just asked if there was any chance of any lessons. She pushed me and pushed me and pushed me, because in those days I was still competing quite heavily myself, and that was my main focus. Focus. Um, however, an opportunity came up, you know, when you have staff at Christmas, everybody wants to go home. So I rang Charlotte and I said, how about coming and do a couple of weeks for me here? Bring your horse, Fernandez, and I'll, I'll help you. And let's see how we go. I ended up doing 10 days cover. 14 years later, <laughs> I've never, never been left. home, you know. He was my idol. I really struggled to even talk to him at first. I felt like I was in a dream that I was with him at his yard. Uh, no confidence, funny enough, with people and situations. And yet, put her on a horse and you've got this real confidence, this exuberance, you know, nothing phases her. Carl actually rang me and said, this girl, Charlotte, she's got a huge amount of feel. I said, she has, Carl. And he said, I think she's quite good. And I said, I think she's really good, Carl. I said, you know, she's got a fantastic technique for Piaf and uh, she's really a, a rider for the future. So I had my own horse there, which I was riding, he was teaching me on. He then just put me on all his horses. So I was riding his, like, top Grand Prix horse, which was pro set at the time. Oh, my God, like, I'm the luckiest girl alive to be given these opportunities. In most yards you go to, you just work hard. You don't get to ride, you know, for years. Some people don't even get opportunities to learn how to ride the more advanced movements for, for Grand Prix. But he put me on his horses to, to learn how to do it. I was like a sponge thinking, this is my chance. This is my chance to really try and live the dream I want to do. How long had you been with Carl at his yard before you met Vallegro, Blueberry? So I met Blueberry instantly because he was one of the horses that I knew because he was like the talk of the town, really. Um, so he was four years old. Carl was riding him in some of the young horse classes. He had the paces that everyone would dream of having in a horse. He had a canter for a 10, so expressive and so powerful. And it's like when you find a connection with a, with a person, that horse is like everything I'd want. And I was like, that, 
that horse is me all over. Carl just said to me, do you want to have a go on Blueberry? Oh my God, really? Really? And he's like, yeah, do you want to have a go? I didn't have time and there was a rule that said uh, if you were a professional rider, you couldn't compete at the lower level. So I said to Charlotte, who was absolutely desperate to ride everything, and I think that's probably where I first started realising that drive uh, is, is almost more important than talent because I've met a lot of talented people. I rode Blueberry and it was like that instant connection. He was everything I th could imagine and more. I think it's like the only way to describe it is if, you know, when you get in a car, like real fancy car, let's say like an Aston Martin and you put your foot down and you like vroom, to the back of the chair, you know, and you are gone. That is what he did to me. I mean, the power he had, I'd never experienced anything like it in my life. And then Carl just handed me over the reins and said, would I like the opportunity to compete him? I, I offered her the ride on Vallegro because um, he was five. I'd competed him when he was four. He was a worker, she was a worker. Their personalities almost matched each other. Together we won everything. And both of us not really knowing very much, you know? So we did it from, you know, the lowest level all the way up then, then to Grand Prix. So it was incredible that he was pretty much unbeatable. You met him when he was four years old. So what was he like when he was four years old? He's always been an incredible horse. Even from four years old, we always said he'd read, uh, read the encyclopedia of dressage. He was a strong horse. And um, again, it was fairly obvious that he was going to be a Grand Prix horse. But at five years old, it's very difficult to predict this, you know, this amazing future that him and Charlotte had together. He's been one of those horses that has been fantastic to train. Um, he has the biggest heart of gold, as you can see. I mean, there's not very many horses that um, you can put anybody on and they just accept it's a, it's a huge honour to be able to have a horse that works with you the way he works with me. They're both performers and they're both really brave and nothing bothers them both. And you can see them go into these fantastic arenas with thousands of people watching them and it never bothered either of them. We won more than we ever dreamed of, of winning, really. And in a relatively short space of time. Absolutely. So I started my career with him, um, you know, 2011, really. I started at top level Grand Prix, uh, not ever riding that level before. So between the two of us, we were learning together. I don't think that combination, that unique, um, that unique bond with Blueberry and Charlotte will ever be seen again. It's his, he is a complete one-off, that horse. There'll never be another horse like him. Vallegro's nature is very much of a, of a calm nature, and he accepts any situation. He's never, ever been uh, a, a skittish horse, a nervous horse. His nature is just one of calmness. Charlotte, therefore, because her personality is one of let's go get them, he allows her to ride him to his absolute maximum ability, and that is what is so special. He's quite um, sensitive, and as you can see, He's he gets there. bored. <laughs> 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 he likes to be doing things all the time, and it was like I got on him and I just clicked with him. It was, I guess it's like anyone that dances, you know, you you just click with that one dance partner. You know, my, I'm very, very competitive. He feels like he loves to perform, like he loves to show off. He's not afraid of anything. The whole plan originally, of course, was for Charlotte to get him nearly to the level of Grand Prix, and then I was going to take over the ride on him. When it got to the time for Carl to take him, he always said to me he got given, you know, an incredible opportunity by the Becklersheimers, who he worked for when he was my age. He wanted to give back what opportunities he had been given. So he said to me that I could keep the ride on Vallegro and, uh, and carry on going, which I was lucky enough to get him to go all the way up to, to Grand Prix. Did you really tell him that he wasn't getting him back? Absolutely. I told him that there's no way that I was going to give him the reins back unless he could do what I've done, which was keep the horse unbeaten.
so you have this incredible role model, mentor, trainer around you to learn from. How long was it before you beat him? I started competing against him on his horse and uh, there was a couple of times where I beat him and uh, it was really funny because, you know, as much as I love Carl, it was always, I'm so competitive. <laughs> I always wanted to beat him. At first, he was kind of like, I think that was lucky. And then, <laughs> and then it happened again and again. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, you know? And it's, it's a bit surreal for me, really, because he was my absolute idol to then think, I'm actually beating you. Like, I'm doing better than you. Like, how, how is this possible? You know, like, I can't be doing this, but I actually am, I'm doing it. She would always want to do her best, especially if in a team event, she'd feel the pressure of uh, having to be at her best for the rest if she didn't do the best. I made myself three goals. So three, three of my dreams I wanted to achieve in my lifetime. One was to ride on a team with Carl. The second one was to ride at London Olympia. And then the third one was obviously riding in London 2012. So when I started in 2011, I got the opportunity to ride on a team with Carl and uh, we actually won the team gold at the European Championships. So, I mean, for myself being my first year, that was pretty much incredible because, you know, I really had no experience at that level. My own ambition started changing and I started enjoying seeing Charlotte riding my horses, having been a competitor myself. That's one thing I can always say Carl had in me is belief. I mean, I think even from my third or fourth lesson, he saw that I had that ability to go quite far in my career. And, uh, you know, I never forget I was training. He said to me, you are good enough to do London 2012. But I mean, how many people dream and make those dreams come true? And uh, for someone like Carl that had all that experience, all that knowledge, then tell me that I was good enough to do an Olympics. I was just overwhelmed to think that that was actually possible. And from that day on, it literally, it was like, gave me so much strength and so much energy to make that then really happen. It's so important, isn't it, to have people in your corner who have got the knowledge, the experience, but also who care about you. Alan, who looks after Blueberry, Again, he looks after Blueberry, but he is 110% there for me behind the scenes. You know, if any dramas go on, I would never know until I've finished. But he knows also that I have enough mentally to deal with, with what we're performing, to keep that away from me and then let me know. We've traveled 75,000 kilometers together, which is like one and a half times around the world. And, um, and with all the three of us, Blueberry, Charlotte and I have all become great friends. And I feel this amazing sense of relief. When we've, we've done it, they've got the medals, and then we're going home, and then I can just relax, breathe a sigh of relief. I have Ian, who is like, the most incredible supportive person that comes all around the world with me. We all love horses so much. Like, at the end of the day, I think that's such a big bond between everybody. We are passionate about our sport, but passionate about horses. I feel so lucky to be able to have that. You know, I say I have, like, the dream team, and I truly do believe I have the dream team. And when you go into the Olympics, in 2012. Is it a different environment when you're competing for GB? I was like a kid in a sweet shop. In two years, I had achieved my dreams, which was to ride on a team, ride at London Olympia, and then go to the Olympics. I was like, oh my God. I got to London 2012, and all I can remember is like turning up and being so excited. I remember going to our arena and it, I think it seated 25,000 people. I think the most people I'd ridden and performed in front of probably was about six and a half thousand people. Any gold medalists I have known over my career have always been partnerships that started at the beginning because the trust that you need um, in, in an Olympic arena is huge. So all of a sudden I see these grandstands like you're looking up and it is like huge towers of people and I'm just just 
craving to get in that arena. I'm just like itching, sitting on the seats, like think, I just want to get in there, I just want to do it. And like Carl is there and he's like biting his fingers, he's like nervous, he's twitchy, he's the absolute opposite. Going into London, we had the pressure to win gold as a team. But as everyone knows, it may not happen on the day, their horses, so anything could happen. Be ready for it. You can't tell your horse that. So, in other words, this amazing relationship that Charlotte and Vallegro got was this confidence that when they went into arenas where so many combinations are affected by atmosphere, they didn't have that because they'd grown up together. And you and Vallegro put in a performance that captivated the nation and propelled you to superstardom. I just never forget, I walked in and a lot of the riders were quite nervous because when we were coming in, being the Brits, being in the home crowd, the crowd were just cheering. To see her enter that arena with everybody all around the sides, it was just something that, you know, you just, well, it, again, it was like uh, dreaming. I just wanted to hit myself to see that I was actually watching my daughter enter that big arena down at you know, at um, the Olympics. For our horses, when they hear clapping and cheering, they get quite nervous and tense. And obviously that's what we don't want. You know, the horses have to be relaxed. So I said to Carl, I'm gonna walk in, I'm gonna let them clap and then I'll go off. And then you have literally the bell rings and you have like 45 seconds to get down and in the, in the arena. So I walk in and I could feel Blueberry, like he just was like bouncing and he was like a bit excited. And everybody clapped and I just patted him on his side and it was like, I could feel him be a bit like nervous and I just patted him and I literally felt him go, oh, it's okay. And he took a breath and he literally, I felt like he was like reassured with the fact that I'd patted him. And then off we went and we did our performance. This situation where most people go into the ring and they're like, they might become nervous themselves or their horse becomes nervous. Um, you know, that horse is just like, I'll give you whatever you want. When I finished, it was the most incredible. It gives me goosebumps now, even thinking about what it sounded like. People were cheering, clapping, stamping their feet. That was something I'd never experienced. It was unbelievable and Blueberry just thought it was wonderful. He just looked up at everybody, looked around, and was like, yeah, I'm here. He's <laughs> a true performer, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. And he just loved it. Winning the team gold, standing on that podium with my teammates, it was just an absolutely incredible moment. The best time of my life to be able to stand in your home crowd and that podium and hear the national anthem with that gold medal around your neck. Nothing beats that. I had to then do the individual, so I knew I had a good chance for the individual, but for me, I said to myself, like I could be in like top four, possibly medal in an individual, get a medal, I'd be so proud. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I could win gold. And the Dutch were so strong, mm -hmm. the Germans were really strong. I honestly just went in there just to do my thing with Blueberry. I had the most incredible music, which was all all London themed, so it was it was just brilliant. And I loved that music. And the minute I put my hand up and it started, it was like there was just me and Blueberry. And we danced our way around the music and at the end I made a little blip. Uh, it was our only mistake in the test. And as I came out, all I can remember is Carl going, that's it. You blew your last, your, your gold medal. You blew it right at the end. You blew that, that's it. You know, you're not gonna win it now. And literally then the whole of the stadium erupting because obviously my score came up and I had actually won individual gold. Oh, it's giving me goosebumps. I just burst into tears. I, I, it, it took me so much by surprise. And at that point, that's when you wanna run and see your mom, because I knew my mom and dad were there and I couldn't get to them. And then you're just swarmed with all these people. And it's like so overwhelming with what you've just done. You, I just couldn't take it all in. It was like happening so fast. And everyone just coming up and running and hugging me, all the competitors, friends, and my mum, and she was screaming through the fence, and I ran to my mum and my dad, and you know, everyone was hugging each other, and it was just incredible. It was, I can't tell you, I was just eaten up with tears and joy, and it was incredible. Her story is like a fairy tale and an aspiration to many. One of those things you'll never 
relive no, or... No, you never replicate no. that. I don't use this expression overly, but Charlotte is a genius. Uh, there's nothing else for her to win in the sport, and just when you think there isn't very much else for her to win, she goes and does it. If you talk about one of those flip the switch moments uh, for the industry, for dressage, for Charlotte and for the public's perception of dressage, it was London 2012. I find really interesting about that story is that Carl says, you blew it. But by saying that, of course, it shows his attention to detail and his understanding of what's happened, but it also shows that he clearly never had a conversation with you that you could win yeah, no, the gold. No, he never put pressure on me. He knew how to, to deal with me and he knew I was a fighter for sure. He always knew that if I did my best, it was enough anyway. He never needed to say anything to me about it. He knew I was gonna go for gold. And I think had he had gone to me and gone, Charlotte, like, you can win gold, I'd think about things so differently. So you have this amazing experience, but what happens when it's all over? What are the demands on you? You know, you are now the golden girl of the British Olympic team of equestrian sport. That was my biggest shock in my career, really. We all got prepared for how to perform, but no one really prepared us for what will happen after. When she got Britain's first gold and found it, and I mean, so unbelievably difficult, her confidence was through the floor. Ironically, after, do, you know, achieving something we'd never achieved before. Winning double gold, I had a lot of media attention and I'd never done media, ever. I'd done little bits, yeah. little interviews here and there, but always had Carl by my side because I was so terrified of doing it. And then all of a sudden, I was just in front of cameras, being interviewed one after the other. And I just remember being absolutely terrified to the point where someone would ask me the question and I would forget the question. I would say to Carl, like, don't leave me. You have to come with me, you have to stand with me. He was her rock in that sense, that I was not on the scene then. Um, and I think for me, it's really just, everybody plays a part in every story. You know, it's not just me, it's not just British Dressage, it's not just Carl. And I think what Charlotte has tried to do is surround herself with people that will give her that input. I really struggled in that side of the after of the Olympics and then seeing myself in newspapers, magazines and getting offers for all sorts of things, I'm like, I just want to be me. Oh my God, this is a different lifestyle for me mentally. I never knew it could be this hard to deal with. In my head, I had all these questions and panic attack of what if, had I been trained maybe beforehand, I would know how to deal with that. But was there nobody from Team GB to help you with double Olympic gold? I had no idea with really training into what would happen. We never really got told that. Did it make you feel like a different person? Like, did you feel like somebody was invading your space and trying to make you into something that you didn't want to be? What I had achieved became a bit of a blur. You're taken through a media zone. Then you have to do interviews and interviews and interviews for TV. Then you go to bed and then you get up the following morning at like 6 a.m. and then you do more interviews and you're like, oh my God, you don't have that time to celebrate and yeah. let your hair down and have a drink and think about what you've actually achieved. It's kind of like boom, boom, boom. I can't manage it. That was the hardest thing for me. When I look back at what I have achieved, I can't say that I have really celebrated because you do one thing after another. Now, when I do things, I make sure I have the time to celebrate because 
that I really do regret probably in my in my career. I think there's so many athletes who say exactly the same thing that when they look back that they haven't had time to really enjoy their success. When things got tough for you, did you look for somebody else to come in and help you? I actually had a uh, sports psychologist. It's really funny when you talk about having a sports psychologist, people look at that as a bad thing. Like A lot of people think that that's a failure, that you're actually asking for help. And for me, it was really important that I understood mentally about how to deal with issues that I found difficult. I was blown away actually because I was quite a reserved person in the sense I used to bottle everything up, hide it all from everyone, put this brave face on and carry on and she actually probably cracked that shell and made me really think about what it is I do, how to deal with it. My difficulty when I went into sport is suddenly discovering that although they're in the limelight and there's all this pressure, there wasn't actually someone who was a confidant who would just chat to them just generally about how they feel, what they would like out of this, any problems they've got, any difficulties. And, and if a girl then expressed any concerns or fears or, or burst into tears, uh, it would be seen as a weakness. Uh, I, I never saw it as being, well, she's under stress and we need to go out and help her, because clearly that's, that's a pretty acceptable thing for any of us to have, particularly a young woman or a young man in elite sport where the, the pressures are immense to perform. Riding, you are on your own, but if you want to make a career out of this sport, you have to be able to talk about it, you have to be able to train other people, you have to be able to travel all around the world and give demonstrations, sometimes to, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people who all come to hang on your word. It is daunting. I've done it myself and it really is one of the scariest things to stand up in front of 2,000 people and talk about what you do. Asking for help is not, it's not a sign of failure, it's a sign of strength, you know, actually saying I need, I need help to understand and visualise why things are going wrong and I think that's not really done enough, I think especially in our sport, you know, not enough people want to have that help because they think it's a sign of failure. I think we've got to start looking at things differently in sport and saying that we're putting people through what are unnatural circumstances for us all to get pleasure, for us all to achieve at the Olympics, and they're paying a heavy cost to this. Now, I know they ought to do it, but I feel a lot of youngsters get pulled into sport at an early age and it becomes almost a habit and there, there isn't really that choice because it's all they've ever known. So I think, if we handle it correctly, then it will be great for all of us, but we need to start seeing that these are particular stresses that need to be addressed in a unique setting. There's a massive advantage to having experienced an Olympic Games when you go into a second one in terms of knowing what to expect. But the flip side of that is obviously the pressure and expectation that comes from being an Olympic champion and people expecting you to achieve again. Heading to Rio, I had a lot more pressure, a lot more expectation. I just kept going higher and higher and higher and my achievements kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then it came to going to uh, Rio and obviously everyone was you're gonna win it, you're gonna win it. What changed by the time we got to Rio in 2016? Um, it was another gold medal performance, but I have to say, I mean, I saw Charlotte physically shaking before she went into the shoot of that final. I really felt the pressure. Like, I really felt that I wanted it more than I'd ever wanted anything. You know, I really wanted to retain my title and get that gold medal. I really have never felt probably so much pressure before. Well, I kind of decided there and then, really, that I was gonna retire Vallegro. I just said to Carl, like, after this test, this is it. This is gonna be it. This is gonna be my final ride on him. But there was something that other people didn't know that Charlotte and I were sharing, you know, as, uh, you know, as trainer and, and, and rider there, was the fact that we said, if this goes well, we will retire him. I always wanted to finish with him being retired at the top of his game. And I think I, there's so many people that do it the other way around, you know. I mean, I could have carried on competing him 
and got more gold medals. But for me, it was so important that he stayed fit, healthy and well. And as you can see, he's 18 years old and still being ridden. And now he just has lovely days where he goes cantering around the fields um, with Alan. It was mixed emotions and it was um, fantastic to see him go out on the top, but it was really sad that I wasn't going to be able to take him to any competitions anymore and go and beat everybody. But um, at the same point, you, you, you want the best for the horse and you want him to be remembered as the greatest horse ever. So, and, um, and we've done that. He does surprise guest appearances at some of the demonstrations that I go to and I take him along and he just loves people. So He's a celebrity, isn't he? He absolutely hates being left at home. If he sees the <laughs> lorry being loaded up and his face is literally like waiting to get on the lorry and then he doesn't get on the lorry, he's yeah. not very happy. He's having his own bronze statue that's going up uh, that's already we've raised money for. It's been, uh, it's been made, commissioned, so that will go up. He has his own street named after him. Uh, up the road. So, you know, he's still, you know, in our area certainly, you know, his, his certainly his fame goes just beyond being, being a dressage superstar. He'd won everything, we'd won it together, we'd achieved so much throughout our whole career that if I could finish it one way, that would be at an Olympic Games winning gold. It was like the nerves kicked in and I honestly just felt like jelly. My heart rate was racing through my jacket. I thought, what if it goes wrong and we need to continue and do something else because we need the horse to end on a win? Blueberry must have known I could feel nervous. So it was a very big decision that we'd made, um, but it was also a very brave ride that she had to have because it was like she wanted to retire him there and she wanted to stop there, but she also had to win to retire. You know, the horses are sensitive and they, and they know. This was my fourth Olympic Games. I had never ridden in Olympic Games with a medal pressure on me. I went down the slope into the arena and I went round the outside and I was still feeling like the heart rate, the legs. And I trotted around that arena and it honestly was the best feeling I could ever describe and it is like someone taking your hand, giving you that hug, squeezing you really tight and saying, you're okay, you can do this. And that's what he did. He just gave me that security that he's like, we can do this, mum, we're going to do this. <laughs> I love it. And we went round that outside and then from that moment on when he made me feel like that, I was like, yeah, I can do this. And that was it, did it. And I nailed that performance. I probably did one of the best performances I've ever done. He was flawless. He did not make one mistake. You know, and I've got to add in here, you know, like a, a relationship between uh, a horse and rider at this level. It's like a marriage. It was fantastic to see, actually, and watch and experience the pair of them come on and blossom and just become better and better the whole time. What I find incredible about that is the intuition between you and Blueberry, that he sensed something from you, knew you were edgy, he calmed you down. To be able to have that partnership with your horse, I mean, most people just look at it and think it's just an animal, but what they don't realise is the bond that you create with that horse, how you can get that horse to trust you, and that horse can give you confidence to believe you can do what it is you want to do. What he did for me and how he set up my career, I can only thank him. I think retiring him, you see so many incredible horses competing and have won so much. And then you see as they get older, I guess it's like any athlete, you know, you kind of hit your peak and then you start to kind of lose form. And I never wanted him to lose that form. I never wanted him to be remembered in fifth place or sixth place. I always wanted him to be remembered the champion that I know he is and he proved he is. What about the legacy of Charlotte Dujardin? The legacy is to have these young up and coming riders follow their dreams like I have really and be inspired by what I've done and what I've achieved and think that that's possible. I feel so honoured to be someone that they look up to. The impact that, that Charlotte had had on not just her sport, but on people who had never even thought that equestrian sport was something that, that they would watch. And, and I think it's really important that she helped break down those barriers. I hope I can now give people my experience, my 
my dreams of what I've achieved and push it further for the younger generation to come through and keep our sport going. Charlotte represents something very different in the equestrian world. She is so fresh and honest and open and grounded. I think she blasts any kind of preconceptions of what equestrian is about. She is a fresh, modern rider and I think a, a huge inspiration to many young women. She wants everyone to do as well as she does. She, you know, there's nothing she feels that anyone can, you know, it can be stopped as long as you work hard and you build this relationship with your horse, um, it's all achievable. You have to take criticism. You have to be in a top athlete. You know, it's not about just being told you're wonderful and you're good. You need to work harder. You need to try different things. You have to be open-minded. Charlotte Dujardin, <laughs> you are absolutely remarkable. Thank Had you. Had the best day. I love everything that you have achieved, but I love even more who you are and the team around you are just, everybody should have a team like that. And oh, thank, thank you so you. much for sharing your story with me.